Um, yeah, so this um, is a talk really about something we've discovered relatively recently, um, and it's about the use of materials. But before I get on to the more uh, modern aspects, I think it's useful to look back through the history, because as engineers, we've generally worked with what the industry's provided us. And I think there's a certain change that in the industry now is more involved with the consultants in forward think about what, what do the consultants need to do the jobs that they do. Um, but historically, I think we need to go back to 1330, and early crown glass was you know, generally what people used for a few hundred years. And it uh, goes back um, to a chap called Philippe de Cochrane Rouen, um, but uh, glass was used in this manner um, from the first and second century in, 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 uh, in Rome, in Rome windows. Um, the next uh, biggest technological advancement um, was in plate glass, um, but it was uh, not particularly practical. Um, but the cylinder process was really when larger sizes came a little bit more, um, a little bit more uh, commercially viable. And this was really elongating long bulb out, as you can see in these um, pictures down here. Um, still a very manual process, though. But it was early in 1874, which was quite interesting, that the first tempered glass was being used. And it wasn't really for tempered glass as we know it today, but really in pressure vessels and boilers so they could see um, whatever's boiling or whatever's at pressure. And this was developed by a, a chap um, called Francois Roy de la Bastille, um, who was a gentleman inventor. Um, so obviously had too much family money. And uh, what he used to do was uh, dip the uh, flat glass into um, uh, tallow or cow fat and different oils and greases to provide um, a temper to the surface. Forwarding on to 1904, the forecourt process was again a, um, a quite a leap in the manufacturing, um, allowing for larger glass plates. Um, and this was introduced into Britain by Robert Chance. Um, this greatly in, in increased production capacity. But it, this is all related to glass at the moment. But in 1905 was the first time lamination really became um, a thing in, in the industry. Still very experimental, and they're using cellulose nitrate, which is um, has a number of other um, uses in gun cotton and so forth. But John Crane Woods patented, patented this in 1905. I mean, in 1909, Edouard Benedictus uh, with uh, DuPont has a Benedictus Award, so it's a name more associated with laminated glass. And legend goes, and it's been repeated so many times, it's fallen into folklore, that he had a glass of chemicals uh, in a jar on his uh, shelf. He went up the ladder to reach up, it fell down, and expecting a massive shards on the floor, what he found is it's all still held together, and that there's evaporation of the uh, solvent and the remaining plastics bonded the glass together. So he went, this is a great thing. So he was also aware of pa um, um, the, the car crashes that have been happening in Paris, and with the nail glass and the windscreens, there's lacerations and very bad injuries. And as the story goes, he saw this um, uh, plastic and glass chunk on his floor in the laboratory and he said well I should be applying this to automobiles and so in 1909 he patented triplex safety glass and then this was then came into the automotive industry but it was still a luxury item and so it wasn't really um, you know considered a standard or something we should be offering or should the, the, the uh, public should have at all is really a luxury um, but in 1932, was getting some more um, current production methods, vertically tempered glass uh, was in 1932, so it's more, effef more efficient, we could temper larger sheets. Um, and in 1934, I don't have an image of this, um, he's quite an obscure Austrian inventor, but the first patent for um, curing a flat glass, and by that he was actually meaning tempering the flat glass. In 1937, the mechani mechanization of flat glass was really pushed forward with a, with a uh, 
an arrangement with Ford and Pilkington for the development of their automobiles. So this line here is really just uh, still working with plate, gla plate glass by the full court process. But it's um, in a long production line similar that Ford's uh, championed polishing and grinding the plates to get very high quality glass or high quality glass than it had before. 1938, a very important um, year as Carlton Ellis invented PVB. Um, he was a chemist, didn't really have a relation to the glass industry as far as I can um, have researched, but um, he, he invented the PVB to combat the discoloring and darkening of the cellulose nitrate over time. And the Pilkton folk process in 1952. Now I've also read that there are two other patents in America in 1902 and in 1925 describing a similar process, but they weren't quite commercialized. And so um, Pilkingtons are, are given um, certainly uh, 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 the, um, the historical um, kudos for um, inventing the float glass process, and it and it took them seven years and a huge amount of investment from this patent to really start producing something that we would um, consider as high quality glass. And it's, then it's quite a long real development until we have our next leap and that is 1998 with this development of Ionoma by DuPont. And that was really to, um, looking at the PVB and say well the PVB we, we use for windows has been great so far but it's really developed for the cars and having something soft which would um, dissipate the energy from a head hitting the windscreen and allow some softness. Um, but this was really developed for the hurricane market and, and the first use was in um, Florida uh, for the Broward County Performing Arts Centre in Fort Lauderdale. Um, but, you know, it's quickly realised that, you know, rather than just in the context of hurricane and preventing debris from uh, penetrating through the glass, we could use it for more structural or abstract structural uh, performance. And this was a project called the Rachofsky screen, uh, screen in the Rachofsky House, which is an art museum by Richard Mayer. And this uh, glass screen um, was designed and installed um, by Jamie Carpenter Design Associates. And the reason for Century Glass Plus, as it's called at that time, for use in this project really was to provide robustness. And as this is a post-tension structure, and what they're concerned with, if a, one of the sheets uh, fails, how do I maintain that stiffness? And the reason it's um, post, um, uh, it is constructed as such is this whole screen disappears into the floor, which is a really quite a novel approach. Um, and mentioning processing capability, um, really we've been talking about um, the, 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 the processes and the materials, um, but in terms of sizes, we, we've come a long way. I mean, I just started in 2006 because that's really where my data ran out quite quickly. Um, but we started with a jumbo size there at six by three. Now there's a couple of people, uh, maybe more that you know, I don't know of, who are producing glass to 20 meters long in, in their process. Um, some is 3.2, some is, some is wider. But that, that's an incredible increase of such a short time. Uh, and do we see any, um, you know, any advancement in that? Maybe, maybe not. I, I think you know, we, we're getting to the cusp perhaps is what is particularly practical and some would say it's not particularly practical at that size. But I mean, it's certainly given us a lot of um, options uh, to use in our design. Um, so these, aren't, um, these are not uh, um, correctly distributed along the line, but it's just really showing what we now have to work with and the development that's gone um, into the process of uh, providing strengthened glass, providing laminated glass, providing tempered glass that we can now use um, as an engineer to employ to a particular performance. Now looking into safety, it's quite clear that in yield glass for the automobiles, it might be good for um, you know, taking the bugs away or stopping them getting to your eyes, but in a car crash, it's not a particularly practical material. And so the tempered glass, that's great. It breaks into small chunks um, and falls relatively harmless to the floor. And the laminated glass, it, it breaks, but it holds the glass in position. So we've got 
in, in our armory, I'd say we've got two main um, uses of trying to provide safety. And what we're always trying to enforce with our clients and engineers and so forth is just because something's called a safety glass, it doesn't mean that it fails safely. The, that we need to engineer it and understand what happens when it fails. Because if you look at large tempered glass um, on the left here, um, I don't know how thick that is. I mean, from the image, it's probably 12 to 15. If it breaks as a single ply, it can still fall out as large chunks. And so in the 1960s, when Pilkins was using armor plates, that was the technology of the day. But you know, I, I think with now, with the materials that we have, having big chunks of uh, tempered glass above, categorize them as safety glass, you know, it, it is not quite correct. So I, you know, a large chunk of glass falling down ha will have a particular um, nasty impact. But it depends on the situation. Is it over a cafe? Is it over an empty space that never gets accessed? All those things need to be thought about. Um, and, and take a laminated glass. Now, this is two sheets of um, tempered glass with a softer interlayer, is, um, maybe PVB. But as you can see, when it breaks, it's lost all its stiffness. And, and so you need to be think, well, we, you know, it breaks safely, the chunks are still held together, but you know, what, what, is, what, what possibly could go wrong? You know, it could, you know, is it held well in its frame um, around the fittings? Will it tear around its fittings? Because having a panel fall down is you know, arguably worse than having a large chunk of tempered glass. So again, these are both called safety glasses, but they both have their limitations. And so we get to the point where, typically as engineers say, high performance or high strength, high stiffness, that's great, that's high performance. But it's quite clear that isn't the case. And this leads to onto the problem that we found. And I can't say that we discovered this. We've heard rumors in the industry and from Robert Kirchner, he's also um, discussed that. But I think we didn't believe it. Um, and we thought it was, you know, it was quite frankly, just, just um, hearsay. So we wanted to pr um, prove it wrong. And fortunately, we didn't prove it was wrong. We proved it's a real, um, real phenomena. So um, what we've had is we, we took a 10 meter, just over 10 meter panel, 1.1 meter wide. And we laminate this fully tempered glass, and it's laminated with an ionomer interlayer. And what we then did was break the central ply. And we broke the central ply. We still break the central ply. <laughs> ah, great, thank you. So, great, thanks. And so we have a characteristic failure pattern, which is all great, and we think, excellent. So we left it, and they go, well, you know, is it really a problem? No, it's not. But 20 minutes later, this happens. So what, hap what, what you can't see here, now it's quite difficult from the image, um, taking pictures of glass is always very difficult. But if we look closely, you can see glass still bonded to the interlayer here. And you see the larger chunk of the middle ply still bonded to this side here. So what we've had is we've got a laminated panel, which um, is considered a safety glass. But what we have now is we have essentially the sheets of glass cleaving in two. Um, and this causes a lot of concern, as you can imagine. So, you know, what causes this? Um, and how, what do we do about it? Now, I'm sure we're all aware of the tempering process. We heat it up, quench it, and lock in those, uh, that strain energy. So, uh, this is my simpleton diagram. We've got people you know, in compression on the out surface, and we've got a, a large amount of tension on the inside surface. So, what we're, you know, our initial um, considerations were, OK, when the glass breaks, it's releasing a huge amount of energy. So, at the, at the cube interfaces, which we always considered a relatively harmless thing, um, we have a whole new set of boundary conditions dispersed throughout the glass, and you know, um, thousands and thousands of them. So, oh, no, I want to go back. So this is our initial state of equilibrium, all bonded together, all great. But if we assume that we have no bond here, our consideration was that um, the central ply is trying to extend. 
but uh, we've got the, uh, um, the interlayer holding it back. So this is creating a huge amount of shear in that um, contact area or in, in, in the interlayer. And so if you look at the fragments, we have in the dotted line, this is our equilibrium with all the with all material um, being uh, consistent across. But once those new boundary layers concerned um, are compromised or boundary, uh, boundary surfaces are created, we're getting that all, they, all these small elements have to find, again, an equilibrium. So the surface is pushing out and the, the central is being sucked in. But so the sucking in, that's fine, but it's this real part of the top which is causing the problem. And so this is generating a crack parallel to the surface. So I should say, um, a lot of this work was done with Mara Overend at Cambridge University. Unfortunately, he's not here. Um, so I'm going to take you through what we've been doing with him in Cambridge. Oh, let me go back. So we had uh, a number of have a number of tests. So we're looking at both monolithic panels, laminated panels, and fracture fragments themselves. And we both did physical modeling and numerical modeling. So what you know, doing a lot of tests is always very expensive. So what we wanted to do was have from those tests have some numerical models that we could play with and see. Know, how is this phenomenon generated, or how does it work? i have better pick up the pace a little bit. Um, so we had an aluminium chamber here, and this, um, we tried to create this as stiff as possible to create, um, sort of, uh, negate any external errors, and we had some transducers on the side here, and you can see some plates running across that then created a stiffer, stiffer box. And then we had uh, the plate, uh, glass plates inserted. They weren't laminated single plies. And we had a PTF sh sheet in between to allow or to reduce the amount of friction. And from that expansion, um, we then put that back into a numerical model and looked at uh, how to create the same phenomena in the numerical model. Secondly, we also looked at laminated panels. And we, again, we can see just the transducers on that central ply there. Again, we failed it and then measured the expansion. And from that, again, we correlated that in some, in some models. And we also looked at the fragments because also with the fragments, we were creating a huge amount of cracks, a, a, a lot of, um, not defects in the glass really, but you know, uh, an uneven surface. So we need to really work out what are the strengths of these shear fragments. So, we, we took it in a standard shear test here to reduce any eccentricities and get as a close, a closer shear measurement as possible. But, you know, again, that's quite difficult, but this is quite a nice example where it's broken right across the surface. Some were breaking very close to the edge, so a few were discounted. And then a simple measurement, or well, not quite simple to make, but a, a measurement of the area was then translated into a um, a shear area. We then again looked at that, modeling it, and tried to create a simpler uh, model to create um, the process uh, in a numerical model. But you know, this is a small amount of the test. And what we're really trying to get to, and the sort of culmination of this relatively um, small data set, was that. We have a set of curves or these lines about um, we have a length of glass, we have um, a, shear, um, a shear stress in the plane, and we, we try to look at what's a safe um, length of glass which we could have and limiting the possibility of that failure. Um, so this, it, we, we, we did do a number of um, glass thicknesses, but again, we didn't do all the interlayers. We'd, we didn't um, go through multiple um, temperature conditions or multiple times. Um, as I said, it's limited. But what we really wanted to do was check that this phenomenon was a, uh, was it a concern or was it just hearsay? Um, and as you can see, it, it is a concern. But you know, the reason why I spoke about the historical aspects of what we do is that you know, mistakes have happened or you know, we have to use materials to the best benefit. And that's not to say tempered glass is the devil, because it's 
particularly useful in certain circumstances. And it's not to say stiff rinse layers are bad, because they're particularly useful in other circumstances. It's just about using the materials to their, the, the advantage that they give. Um, so really, as a summary of the talk before I disappear out of time, that designing with probe materials, one is the effects um, that contribute to this, uh, let's call it the K2 failure, which is really regarding the failure in the surface plane, is we have a glass thickness. The glass, as the glass thickness changes, we have more strain energy in the surface. Um, the number of plies in the laminate. Now, in this test, we did a triple laminate and broke the central sheet. We're also concerned about what happens when we break an outer sheet of a multiple laminate. We do have some asymmetry there, so from the geometric change of the panel, I'm sure we've all seen a failure of a two-ply laminate and, uh, and the panel bows out towards a fractured edge. Um, but um, to our knowledge, that's never been investigated or analyzed before. Um, so, you know, the stiffness of the overall uh, laminate has an effect. The glass type, obviously, the higher the amount of strain energy in the glass, the higher, the greater the force on the initial failure. Interlayer type, the stiffer the interlayer, obviously, the, the, um, the greater force that can be generated. So, um, but with the interlayer type, we also, you know, they're all uh, viscoelastic, so we need to look at operating temperature and we need to look at what are the loading conditions. And we also need to look at the boundary conditions. So when we do have failures, what is there to provide um, robustness in, in terms of that failure? But it's, you know, as we all do with glass structures, it's about designing safely. So what happens when something fails? And so it's not all doom and gloom. I want to just say that you know, a few of our past projects, or re recent projects, is that we can build things with large-scale glasses. Now, this is K11 in Hong Kong. Unfortunately, we don't have any nice images of um, uh, the, uh, the finished uh, project. Um, but the, the, the glass tubes here, these are uh, nine meters tall. Um, but these are annealed, so it involves a lot of effort in terms of looking at the thermal stresses. So we had a, you know, a very detailed design um, um, we created the own prog program internally to look at the thermal stresses, and, and these wrap around the whole building. So they're all um, experiencing different thermal um, loads. We've um, got two more slides. Um, this is a project. This is Cathedral of St. Patrick in New York. Um, and so we have six tons of glass here filling out the nave. I'm not sure. Someone will have to correct me who's got better <laughs> knowledge about uh, churches than I have. Um, but this glass beam over here um, is heat strength, and so we, we wanted to make sure that the, that had capacity and wasn't susceptible to these sorts of problems. And lastly, but least, uh, uh, an Apple project. This is Westlake stair. This is heat strength and glass. We've got uh, fittings cut in there. And so we absolutely couldn't afford um, to have any ply in this um, failure. I think this is six, 16 meters so, um, with, uh, with century glass. So all these projects are still possible. Um, we just need to design them carefully and re robustly. Um, as again, this, this was done with Mario, but unfortunately he was uh, otherwise indisposed today. So uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Graham. That was a very nice insight into laminated glass. I'm sure there are a lot of questions here. Yeah, Michael? Thank you for the excellent presentation. Um, th this would appear to be um, a length-related uh, phenomena. So if you have a very long panel, um, the amount of expansion you get for a broken panel is probably proportional to its length. So for a 10-meter panel, it, it's, it's more of a factor. Is there some sort of cutoff at which it's not such an effect? Well, that's part of where we want to go next. We want to study this phenomenon in greater de detail. Uh, and, you know, we will be starting a study group because this is very poorly understood. Um, and when um, we first started looking at papers, there's nothing out here. But, but yes, it's predominantly about length, but it's also about the stiffness of the interlayers. So what interlayer are we using? Is it an ionomer, which is stiffer than the others? But then when we have a chosen interlayer, what, what are the operating temperatures? So we have projects in the Middle East where the glass is extremely warm, the interlayers are warm, and we might need a stiffer interlayer to provide a marginal the benefit from some composite action. But at the moment, it, 
you know, it has to be a balance of all, all these factors. So, yes, you're right, the longer the panel is, the greater shear stress you can motivate with all other factors being equal. Um, but that's not to say there's a cutoff line. And I, I think from a design aspect, w we can't give that, and I think it'd be irresponsible to, because um, I, at the moment, all these problems need to be thought through and get some safe guidance out there. Okay, one, one more question, final one. Yeah, Ian, okay. Thank, thank you very much. Excellent work and interesting. But I, I have one remark. I would be very careful to call it a K2 failure because for two reasons. First of all, you have to consider the still remaining stress condition from the relaxing um, uh, stresses from when the tempered glass breaks. So you will have still a significant amount of stress in this piece that you have. And this is also in thickness direction. So you will have thickness direction stresses. And secondly, the test you do on the shear is not a real shear. It's a, uh, in the end, it's not a pure shear. You cannot do a pure shear. So yeah. um, the final fracture will not be a K2 fracture, but I think the, the, the real fracture con here is still a K1, but this is just depending on the stress um, directions that you get from these two effects. So from the temper stress that is still in the piece and then from the test you do. So, so to call it K2 might be misleading because it's not really K2 failure, it's maybe engineering K2. Well, I, th I think that from the trying to um, take the sam fractured samples, the small fragments, and shear them is incredibly difficult. Um, but what we, s what we saw on the large-scale sample is that the fracture surface is absolutely parallel um, to the face. So measuring the stress of those um, components, yes, there's, there's errors there. And we need to do more testing with, without a shadow of a doubt. Um, we need to start this process and we need to get, I, I think that there has been you know, hearsay of these things happening, but they haven't been talked about yet. So I think it's very important that this study is continued and we'll be starting a study group to really push this forward. Um, but yes, I, you know, I, measuring the shear of glass is notoriously difficult, but we're trying to do the best we can to understand, trying to get some boundaries in terms of, so we can give some advice, so we can design safely. But I think that will come out of the further research. But noted, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. We are running out of time. Uh, I'm sorry, Already. there would be a lot of more questions. Uh, thank you very much thank again, you. Graham. Thanks. Hi there, did you like what you just saw? If you did, why not like the video? Drop us a comment below as well as share the video with others since GPD is all about sharing. And to receive more videos in future, subscribe and don't forget to click the bell icon for notifications. Ciao!